Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to EdChat Interactive. And oh, I have to, let me just admit a few more people who have just come in. My name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm the host, but I'm going to be, for the most part, in the background as Aditya and Amrutha are, are leading us in the discussion of incorporating virtual reality in the classroom. Uh, they're both featured speakers at the Serious Play Conference, which unfortunately has had to be postponed. Uh, but um, to a certain extent, we're doing it virtually now, and uh, there's a chance that that will be run in the fall or we'll just have a virtual conference um, throughout the year. So um, I just want to bring uh, a couple ground rules. Because there are so many people here today, uh, we, we, what we've tried to do in the past is invite people to come up on stage and ask questions directly. But with this many people, I think it's probably best if people ask your questions through the chat or uh, click on the uh, raise hand um, if you have something that you want to come up and say to the speakers directly. So those are the two best ways to, uh, to speak and then let you know that our website, edchatinteractive.org, uh, we have other uh, webinars that are coming through Serious Play or th from other sources that are uh, that are geared to education and hopefully you find them as interesting as you're going to find today's talk. So I'm going to uh, fade into the background now and let Aditya and Amrutha introduce yourselves. Um, so and you can share your screens. Uh, w welcome and thank you for coming. I will do that. Thank you for having us. Super excited to be a part of this. Can you see my screen? I think it's coming up now. Uh, but I'm seeing black right now. Oh, is it not working? It says you started screen sharing, but there's no, right now it's, I'm just seeing black. Hmm. Oh, there it is. All oh, right. we just had it. Oh, we just we, had it. We just had it and we lost it. Yeah. I th there it? we go. There we go. Yep. Yep. Can you see the slides? It looks no, like I just the, see a desktop. It looks like the earth. Yeah. Um, other than you want to try, because for some reason it's not sharing my Chrome. I sure. Do you all see my screen? Yes. Although now it's, yeah, okay. there, that's better. Okay, and let me just hit present. Um, and if I minimize this, um, what do you see now? Uh, it's taking, it's it's good. It's um, actually, I don't think that we're seeing the present mode. I think we're seeing yeah, the, exactly. um, the, the other one. Um, you may have two monitors and you may be sharing one let's, monitor. Let's, let's try this. How about now? How mm -hmm. about now? It's bigger. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, okay. yes. There we go. Oh, okay. There okay. We go. What, are, what have you seen? Your slides. We're good now. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. So you're seeing a slide that says incorporating virtual reality in the classroom, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's awesome. been, and, and, and somebody said we should be doing this in VR. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great suggestion. In the near future, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I can go ahead and get started then. And then I'll, uh, I'm going to uh, kind of introduce the stuff that we're going to talk about. And then I'll have Amrita jump in um, subsequently. But I wanted to just start with um, giving a quick introduction um, to ourselves. Um, uh, please feel free to uh, put your questions on the chat. And um, we have our um, email addresses up there. Um, it's also our first names at inspiritvr.com if you ever want to get in touch with us. We want to be here available as a resource to you. Um, and so uh, do not hesitate to reach out to us during, before, after um, um, this session um, anytime if you want to um, get involved, learn more, or just uh, find ways in which we can be helpful um, to you. 
um, uh, both of us, Amrita and I, um, got started um, with um, this this startup and this company um, as a venture-backed um, organization uh, just a little over a year ago. But uh, prior to that, we both spent around two to two and a half years doing a lot of research in virtual reality and um, educational virtual reality. Both of us were initially at Georgia Tech, and then I moved on to start my PhD at Stanford, and I work at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab. Um, here at Stanford um, and also uh, in the Graduate School of Education and kind of our research and our work um, is broadly looking at how we can meaningfully design and develop VR experiences that um, can uh, find long term and more sustainable integration in real world classroom environments. Um, so um, I want to um, just um, start with just giving you a quick intro. In Spirit as a company, it's a VR technology platform. Um, what we do essentially is we're just using um, virtual reality to, to, to bring the best of VR and to bring the best of what VR can do to the classroom. We have a lot of research and evidence that shows that um, just five to seven minutes of immersive virtual reality simulations, when done well, can really significantly boost student uh, critical thinking skills, self-efficacy skills, overall engagement levels, and just uh, fundamentally build a deeper sense of curiosity and um, and um, a deeper passion for learning um, the topic, whether the topic is science or STEM more broadly, um, as well as in the social sciences. Um, and so our vision really is trying to see how we can make this more accessible and more usable um, at, um, at scale. Um, how does VR work? So kind of just jumping just briefly into research, and this is kind of the bit that excites me the most personally. Um, so, I mean, some of you would have experienced uh, VR, uh, most of you would have experienced some kind of VR, um, um, I think. And um, I mean, the honest uh, truth is if I take you into a VR experience and on the right side, you can see these two photos of you um, essentially walking the plank in VR. Um, you're inside the headset, you're walking this plank. Um, the, the, your brain is telling you that, hey, this is a fake world. This is not real. I mean, this is CGI. This is animation. Of course, this is not a real world. Of course, um, um, I'm going to walk this and nothing's going to happen to me. However, the moment uh, you jump, the moment I ask you to jump from this plank, um, the real part of your brain, your fight or flight response uh, section of your brain has not significantly evolved to realize the difference between what's real and what's not. So when you jump, it generates the same physiological response in your body as if you were jumping from a real plank or a real skyscraper. And so we call that uh, kind of that phenomena presence. Presence is a, is a, is a terminology, it's a measurable term. And what VR lets you do is it, it consciously um, you believe that you're not in VR or you, I mean, you consciously believe that you are in VR and you consciously believe that this is a fake world, but subconsciously your body and your brain um, can, can fool you into um, believing that you are somewhere else by generating the same physiological indicators. Um, and we have a lot of evidence um, from research that shows that if you can establish this presence in virtual reality, and if you can then follow that with a very deeply immersive experience, that leads to learning. So, 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 so for, for example, imagine I, I, can, um, I can put you inside um, a, a human cell. Um, I, I have you bring you in front of a microscope. I have you insert a slide under the microscope. You look into the microscope and we zoom right in. And then on the left side, what you're seeing is DNA um, or RNA transcription that's taking place followed by translation. And you're actually actively engaged in the process of developing or, 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 or assembling an RNA helix. Um, that experience, that role playing um, where you feel present inside this microscopic world and you are then performing an activity, that's what leads to a deeper sense of, um, of, of self-efficacy, of confidence, and just that curiosity-driven, critical thinking, um, problem-solving skills. It also gets much more interesting when uh, we can um, establish presence in the shoes of somebody else. So I mean, imagine this uh, taking you to the North Pole and showing you the ice caps melting and kind of establishing that sense of what climate change really looks like um, by being present in the North Pole. Um, or um, putting you in the shoes of someone of a different um, background, a different gender, a different race, a different nationality, a different ethnicity, and then you seeing something from their first person perspective in VR, um, and then really experiencing what it may be to be that other person. These are some really powerful use cases for VR, um, but fundamentally VR works if we can establish significant and strong presence. So um, kind of going to that, uh, what does it take to establish presence? Really a large amount of it depends on the kind of hardware that you use. Um, on the left side, we have tried to kind of progressively uh, kind of categorize virtual reality hardware. And this may be useful for, um, for, for many of you teachers because um, 
there's tons of different kinds of devices out there. There is no standardization of what the norm is for VR. And so um, typically um, what most of you would have seen are these 360 degree um, images or videos that YouTube uh, may have as well. These are typically panoramic um, images that can be captured with your smartphone as well, or also with these specialized 360 degree cameras. Um, and uh, largely um, a lot of this content is accessible on these Google Cardboard uh, kind of uh, devices, which are these um, low cost um, devices that sometimes are made of cardboard, but also can be made of other material like plastic. But typically these devices use your smartphone and the technique is you insert your smartphone into these devices and you kind of put it on and uh, you get a sense of, of VR. This is actually the most basic and the simplest form of VR. In fact, another way you can access these panoramic images and content is even without these headsets on your web browser. A simple example of this is going into, onto Google Maps on your web browser, Google Chrome or Firefox. Um, and uh, you can actually look at 360 degree images of any part of the world. And that really is an ex example of um, what some people would call VR. Um, then just above that, again, I'm looking at the left column here. Um, we call these, uh, these experiences uh, a little more interactive where now you can actually touch, engage with the experience and the environment. You can actually click on stuff, make active decisions. Um, typically these are accessible on devices like the Google Daydream, the Oculus Go. And what these devices allow is some of them have a remote, some of them do not, um, but they let you move in uh, in three rotational dimensions. So moving your head up and down, left and right and sideways. And so we call these devices three degrees of freedom headsets. And so these headsets allow you to move in three different dimensions essentially. But all of these dimensions are rotational. You still cannot physically walk a few steps up and down in these devices. And then of course the highest and the most interactive form of VR at the consumer level that exists today um, are these um, HTC Vive, Oculus Rift, Oculus Quest is the newest one that does this. Um, these are your super immersive ones that allow you to move in the three dimensions of rotation, but also three more dimensions of translation and six uh, degrees of freedom. And when I say translation, I mean moving forward and backward, left and right, and kind of jumping up and down. Um, so these devices, uh, the, the disadvantage or the downside of these devices is they're often required a space, a six by six or a larger space. Some of these devices require external cameras that track you. Many of these devices require you to tether the device to a physical PC or a computer. Um, but the beauty of these devices, these are super immersive, super, super powerful, super immersive. Um, and you, they typically come with two controllers. So you actually have a lot more um, opportunity to interact very hands-on um, with um, the experience. Um, Amrita and I got started with VR really trying to uh, kind of strip it down to the most basic version. So we started working with panoramic images and 360 content, really trying to understand how could we make this technology work at scale in the most low income um, uh, conditions or environments possible. So back in the summer of 2016, we took VR into a low income community in Mumbai in India, um, which is where we first got started. This was when I was also uh, working on a project with the Google um, education team. And this is around the time when Google Expeditions, which some of you may have heard of, um, um, was gaining a lot of traction. Um, and later on, Amrita will talk a little more about Google Expeditions and what that library um, offers. Um, but really this was the first time we, the two of us were inspired to, to bring VR um, and to really invest our, our careers into VR and this technology because this was the first time we saw um, uh, students uh, using VR in a very um, seamless way. Um, we had teachers co-design lesson plans. We had them watch these on extremely affordable Google Cardboard headsets with recycled smartphones. Uh, and the beauty of this was uh, many of our students also made their own Google Cardboard. So you didn't even have to pay for these cardboard devices. And we really noticed very high increases in, in students asking deeper questions about the subject area, engaging more deeply. And all of this was just with five to 10 minutes of VR that was integrated into the classroom. So kind of the biggest takeaway from this experience for us was that um, VR only worked well if it was aligned with curriculum, if it was aligned with syllabi, if it was aligned with standards, and if the teacher found real significant value in making this work. And so to be very honest, these are similar reasons for why any education technology works in the classroom. It has to be meaningful to start with. And the simple glamour and the wow factor of the technology is not enough because glamour and wowness wears off over time. 
we followed this up with another study in Atlanta a year later, where we had students become creators of these experiences. But again, we were trying to study similar aspects of VR integration. What does it take to make this seemingly expensive, seemingly out of reach technology affordable and accessible in the classroom? And we again uh, were able to demonstrate um, students uh, uh, again, introspecting as they created these experiences and experienced VR, the big theme of VR for this project was uh, hunger and homelessness, where we had the students actually film and tell stories from various perspectives around homelessness in the city of Atlanta. So from the perspective of someone managing a food bank and what does it take to manage a food bank on a daily basis from their eyes, quite literally. Um, and again, the, this was again inspiring us more and more to really see how we can push for uh, affordable and accessible VR um, in the classroom. Um, we then went into more formal STEM education and uh, in uh, Cobb County, Georgia, we spent a summer and we uh, conducted a large scale trial where we kind of did a comparative study of VR with a couple of other control conditions. Um, and we had the students watch um, freshman biology, NGSS and Georgia state standards aligned biology content. And this was the first content that we had created um, as in Spirit. This was around the same time in Spirit as a company was just um, getting started. And we were kind of trying to build an organization out of research that um, we were doing. Um, and this was the first, we, we were able to demonstrate very high increases in critical thinking skills, engagement, interest, and deeper um, kind of long-term um, um, curiosity driven learning for um, science. This was just again five minutes of biology content that was used in the classroom um, uh, once a day for a week. Um, and uh, again, introductory biology. So imagine a flight through of the human cell, um, going into a plant cell, kind of observing the different organelles and understanding the spatial understanding and the relationships of these devices, of these, of these organelles um, within this microscopic world. And it really helps put um, images and a spatial understanding to just text that students typically are reading on a textbook or just to the video that they're seeing of a cell. And it really, it really is a different experience when you're able to manipulate that DNA helix and, and understand how um, a process like transcription or translation works, which is so three-dimensional and so highly um, um, immersive. Again, all of this was done on very inexpensive Google Cardboard headsets with um, kind of consumer smartphones. Um, but this was kind of the first time we, we did this as a company and we realized that we wanted to be that bridge. In Spirit, wanted to be that bridge between very cutting edge research and practical classroom challenges and really be that bridge to bring the best of VR into the classroom in meaningful ways. So I'll let Amrita kind of jump in now into um, kind of what uh, we um, think um, VR can afford and what it can do. So I'm, I'm just gonna go over um, actually using VR in the classroom and my part might be a little quicker, um, but why is VR considered an incredibly powerful tool for learning? So some of the most common reasons that are said today are that it causes deeper critical thinking skills, it increases engagement, it's immersive, um, it's a one-to-one -one focused learning experience, and that's a term that we tend to hear a lot around VR in education and in learning. Um, it increases confidence and self-efficacy. You see higher motivation levels. And finally, there's increased knowledge retention for procedural tasks, so tasks that involve simulations. For example, if you were learning how to weld something, or if you were learning the steps for a DNA replication, um, it would increase knowledge retention for simulations like that. So how can you integrate VR into different learning environments? Since we're focusing on the classroom, we took to the three locations where you could actually um, try integrating VR. So this could actually be physically in the classroom where your teacher integrates VR. Um, this could be in computer labs, libraries, or other open spaces that your school or university has where um, you would just set up VR one time and all the students in your school could use it. Or this could be at home where you give VR as homework. So um, looking in the classroom, so the first um, scenario that I wanted to touch upon using VR in the classroom is one-to-one -one VR. So um, when you use traditional VR in the classroom, you can either view VR or you can create VR as you guys saw from some of our earlier research. So some of the pros from viewing VR in a one-to-one -one setting in the classroom is that every student is gonna be viewing the same content at the same time versus having to pass off headsets. And it's also one-to-one -one learning. But some of the cons are that it's really expensive. Um, it tends to disrupt the flow of the classroom just because the teacher needs to bring out all the headsets, hand it to their students. 
and then cleanup also takes a while and we know that time um, the time that teachers have is really limited uh, student collaboration is also very limited the same pro that it's one-to-one -one learning also ends up being a con because students aren't necessarily working together when they're in VR and typically when you're doing one-to-one -one VR in the classroom you can only use those three dot VR devices that we were talking about the three degrees of freedom just because there probably isn't enough space to give every student a six by foot um, space to do VR um, when it comes to VR creation some of the pros are that students can work on VR projects using existing classroom technology. For example, um, laptops or um, iPads or Chromebooks that they already have. So um, when we talk about different VR projects, um, students can actually take very simple Google Street View images, right? So 360 images, and they can kind of cut and paste things and put them together. And this is a really interesting VR project that can be done. Um, it works with free panoramic images such as Google Street View images and Aditya and I are happy to share other resources that we know about for VR creation. But some of the cons are that if you do want to take original content, so if you want your students to create 360 VR videos and record this content, they are going to have to go outside the classroom or um, they'll need to use time outside of school to actually get that, those videos. Sorry, was there a question, by the way? If there is, I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah, there was a question. Someone was asking uh, about um, wh whether we could uh, share some peer-reviewed articles that use RCTs to really show better learning in VR. And yes, absolutely, I agree with you. A lot of studies out there do not have um, good control conditions. And also, they um, are often, like you said, they, they measure things that are usually very hard to measure or things that are very vague or abstract. Um, there are studies, this is kind of the biggest um, gap and the hole in the field in our research lab at Stanford does try to kind of address this. Um, um, we are trying to do a lot more studies. Um, the other challenge with VR and learning uh, research is a lot of this research has happened in the laboratory, in a very protected, in a very um, shielded environment. And very often what ends up happening is when you do a pre-test and a post-test to demonstrate some sort of efficacy or some sort of learning outcome, you're going to see very positive outcomes in the lab um, with the control. But the moment you take it outside the lab into a practical real world learning environment, whether that's a classroom or whether that's any other environment, a lot of things break. A lot of things do not work the way um, they would have worked in a laboratory. And so as important as it is to, to read um, kind of peer reviewed research that has taken place in the lab, um, which I can definitely share links of after this um, call is over with you. Um, there is also a lot of um, uh, kind of push in this field to, to take a lot more VR outside the lab into practical um, learning environments. Yep. Um, so, and I think someone asked if we have any content for Chinese. We currently don't at this time. I just wanted to address your question. Mm -hmm. you asked us. Um, cool. So I'll continue. So the other type of VR that you can do in the classroom is one to many. So one device for many students. Um, some of the pros for this are that it's collaborative learning. It's much cheaper than one to one VR since you don't need individual phones for every student and individual devices. The cons are similar to before. Um, it does disrupt the flow of the classroom and you will need screens to cast whatever the viewer is watching. Um, in terms of creation, the pros are that students are working together. It also works with free software. And the con is the same as one-to-one -one VR. Um, you might need to use time outside the classroom for original content. So when it comes to VR in computer labs and libraries, um, this is kind of what Aditya and I think is probably your best bet when it comes to integrating VR in the schools. Um, so one of the biggest pros are that it doesn't actually disrupt the flow of the classroom. Since it's in a separate lab or space, teachers can always take their students to this location whenever they want to teach them VR. And they don't need to actually set up anything. It only needs to be set up once in the computer lab or library, and then everyone in the school can use this. It's also significantly cheaper for the school because you're just buying one device. And since you're keeping it in the library, Traditionally, when you do classroom VR, um, they, people tend to buy cheaper devices, which then wear out over time, whereas a lab or a library can probably buy one of the more higher end devices that are more expensive just because the device is going to last longer. And finally, students can actually view content on their own time, even outside the class. Uh, the only con is that this does require space in the school that's outside the classroom so that that setup can last. 
And finally, doing VR at home. The pro is that it doesn't disrupt the flow of the classroom and that students can obviously view content on their own time. This is also significantly cheaper for the school since they don't necessarily need to be providing the devices. But some of the biggest cons are that students actually need access to the right devices at home and that this can be very, very expensive for the students. So depending on the demographic, um, this might not be one of your best options. And I guess I, if I just should answer the latest question about the optimal kind of computer requirements, um, it, it really depends on uh, the headset um, and all of these headsets on their website will list out the optimal computer requirements. I will point anyone who wants to get into kind of high end VR uh, to look at the Oculus Quest. The Oculus Quest is the is one of the latest ones. It's very high in quality. It's six degrees of freedom and it requires no external PC. It requires no external cameras or tracking. It's just a standalone independent device. And so if you're really considering um, something like the Rift, um, the Quest is almost equivalent to the Rift uh, without the need for all that bulky PC and other um, support stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Quest is, um, it has all the same functionalities that the Rift does mm -hmm. without the need for a computer. And I think someone also responded saying that you can hook up the Quest to a PC. Yes, you can for casting. Yep. And, and I do want to get into all of that. Maybe I'll just run through everything else really quickly yep. and we'll get back to questions. So um, we just wanted to go over some of the um, current products that exist. So first, we were just going to touch upon what's actually available for 3 off headsets. So your basics is just your Google Cardboard, which only requires a smartphone and then actually buying the Google Cardboard headset or anything similar to that. Um, this can only be viewed by one student. And typically, if you have the YouTube app on your phone, um, you can just open up any um, 360 enabled YouTube video and just watch it on the Google Cardboard and it works perfectly fine. Um, Google Expeditions is the other big thing that's in a lot of schools right now. This is also for one-to-one -one VR and Google Expeditions actually gives you a kit of about 10 devices. So they give you the smartphones, they give you the Google Cardboards as well. Um, it's about $10,000, so it is pretty expensive. And one of the biggest cons is that you can only view Google Expeditions content on this and you won't be able to view any other content on these devices. Um, the same goes for the other devices as well. For all of these devices, you can only view the content provided by that particular company and you won't be able to view any other content. And so Class VR also has a 3 dot headset. Um, they do give you a controller though that you can use to click on. And the good thing about Class VR is that it is aligned to standards. That is Class VR, Merge VR, and MalScience VR are all aligned to state and um, national standards. But um, Class VR and Merge VR, mostly only have passive content where you're viewing the content. And for Mel Science VR, they only cover chemistry right now um, and they don't cover other subjects. In terms of what's available for six stop headsets, so um, one of the companies that's been around for a while is Labster. So they are still kind of a three DOF company. Uh, so they use the Google Daydream. So the cool thing about the Google Daydream is that um, you can move forwards, backwards, left and right. But the only they give you a controller that only allows you to click. Um, they don't give you both the hand controllers that a Rift or a Quest would give you. So you don't have full control of your experience. Um, Labster is also predominantly used in higher education. So it's used um, for complex virtual lab simulations in different universities, complex chemistry and complex biology lab simulations. They're also aligned to standards and they are slowly expanding to other six stop headsets. Um, in terms of what we do, uh, just because we haven't touched on that, we, um, after all our research, decided to focus on six stop because we thought that that was the biggest gap. Um, so we are creating content on the Oculus Quest, Rift, HTC Vive, and the Vive Focus, and we're mostly hardware agnostic. So we do try to be compatible on any new headset that comes up. And um, it is really a true six stop experience where you can walk through the experience, pick up things, move them around, and our content is also aligned to state and national standards. Uh, really quickly, just what do we do? Uh, we have three core engines. So we cover content in biology, chemistry, and physics. So we have about 25 mini simulations that can be done over and over again. So for example, for physics, if you're learning about friction on an inclined plane, we have an inclined plane that you can set up at different angles and then um, you can change the material of the actual plane and then put different objects of different masses on it 
and see the actual vector diagrams happen in front of you so that you can simulate physics and get an intuitive understanding of these subjects. Uh, because most of science is something that um, you need to try out before you believe. And so we try taking the complex topics taught in high school and in early university and bring those topics to VR. And I wanna, I could go on, but I'm gonna stop right now. And I would love to answer people's questions. So I saw that there was a question about earth science or forensic science. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they are they on the horizon? So yes, they are for us at least. We are looking into those. We just wanted to start with the pure sciences first. And so for the main sciences. So one of the things that you were bringing up earlier is that you pointed out that students used uh, I guess the Google glasses for just five minutes and it, they showed an increase in critical thinking skills and also in retention for that material and other material. So one of the things that I'm hearing is that you don't really need to have the whole course in VR, that you could have short sections of it to illustrate some of the more difficult concepts and then that has ramifications throughout everything else related to that content. Did I get that about right or? Yeah, yeah, yeah so. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, something that we don't recommend. Um, you actually are not supposed to be in VR for more than 20 minutes. Uh, I think the headsets are getting better and better, but um, just from a health perspective, it's probably better to limit your time in the headset. Um, what we're seeing with a lot of companies today is a lot of people just throw things into VR to be cool, um, but it's not necessarily useful to put that in VR. So you definitely need a good teacher. Um, you need things that happen. It's almost like a lab, right? It's not like you can go into a chemistry lab and learn a lot without having understood the underlying theory before you went in. So, so, the, so the interesting thing also is that when people actually, when VR kind of was just gaining momentum and traction, a lot of people saw VR and they were like, huh, uh, VR is an upgrade to video. So how can we take what we have in video and just make a better version of that for VR? So, so what people started doing initially was they started doing a lot of video conferencing in VR. They would bring like a Skype for VR or a Zoom for VR, or they would bring VR classrooms where, hey, you're, you're learning um, stuff on Khan Academy with a teacher and a whiteboard, um, but you just see the whiteboard. What if I put you in a classroom with 25 other virtual avatars who are my peers, and then I learn um, straight in front of me with a teacher? It, it turns out that that's really not the best use case for VR. The question that you should be asking is not um, how does VR do better than video or how is VR an upgrade? But the question we, we try to ask is how can you do things in VR that were never possible before? Um, what are things that were just impossible to do before or that are just too dangerous to do in the real world or that are just really expensive to do in the real world? And this is really things like making you really, really small, taking you into microscopic worlds, making you really, really large, taking you into macroscopic worlds. And and making you conduct experiments like chemistry experiments that may be too dangerous or too expensive for most students or most learners um, to do. And we think that's the sweet spot for VR. VR works best when it is integrated in tandem with everything else happening in the classroom or in the school. Um, it, it really works best when you, when you have um, the teacher prime the students, have the right kind of activities done before VR, and then kind of wrap it up with the right activities after VR, just as any other education technology. If I just make you randomly read a news article um, without giving you the appropriate context, uh, the learning um, that you want to derive from it may be missed out on. And this is true for even VR. It's a very powerful, it's a very immersive experience, but it works best when you integrate it and situate it in context of what's happening in the classroom. And what's about the earliest age that people, kids could use VR? So the hardware, the devices, I think Oculus says uh, 13 plus, um, maybe. Um, I, I would like to just check that again. Um, uh, I would say just follow the hardware um, requirements or what the, what the hardware recommends. Um, in our experience, we don't like to work with, yeah, we don't like to work with young, uh, like kids under, like below, lower than middle school, just from, um, I guess, I, I personally feel like there is not enough um, research out there um, that, gives me enough confidence to, to work with kids uh, under kind of middle school age. I'll say I've worked with five and six year olds and the goggles themselves, A, don't really fit, B, they're really heavy. And whereas, you know, they love the experience, they love it for a minute or two, uh, mm -hmm. but they get tired of it pretty quickly. It also that's, that's been my experience. With their memories. And so when they're too young, you don't want to give them 
too realistic of a fake experience because um, they tend to think that it actually happened. So. Right. There's a question about platforms that incorporate a lot of different educational content. Mm -hmm. And um, I, so we found stuff on Steam mm -hmm. that has mm -hmm. um, uh, stuff from, you know, all different vendors. I don't know. Do you have other recommendations? Yeah, I mean, so there's that's I think that's the biggest bottleneck with VR, right? You don't have like a library of VR content. And that's kind of what we are trying to create here at Inspirit. And I think there are some people doing that, but again, in very specialized and niche fields, um, 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 like like we mentioned, Lapster and Lapster predominantly focuses on higher ed laboratory yep. simulations largely, um, um, and they have a large library. But again, it's growing. Um, there are um, um, Steam is kind of the the like the app store um, almost um, for for the HTC. Um, um, and also some of the Oculus devices. And so Steam um, originally was a was a game uh, platform. So a lot of video games were made on Steam, but largely now a lot of um, VR content for education is also going on Steam, including our content. Our content is also available on Steam. Mm -hmm. um, I do think there is a lot of medical science content out there though. Um, so there yeah. is a lot of um, stuff just for medical students to learn, um, basic anatomy. We are also working on creating an anatomy engine as well for the human body. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some stuff out there that we know of. Yeah, we think we think K-12 is the underserved um, um, market right now for VR, um, but also I think the biggest opportunity, um, especially looking at middle and high school, um, is, is the big focus for us. And as you're developing content, what tools do you use? So we're using Unity. I saw a couple of people asked us. Uh, so mm -hmm. we create all our models in-house. So we use Maya for that. And then um, we use Unity. Yeah, the, the beauty of Unity is it's just such a such a versatile platform. Um, and it's so we, easy to learn. Probably only takes about a half an hour, right? Yeah, the, there's lots of- No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually it is. So the wonderful thing about Unity is, yes, you need to, you need to know how to code, um, but um, Unity does have a lot of support for kind of first time developers. There's also a lot of other drag and drop systems um, that are not as versatile as Unity, but definitely are interesting ones that you can explore and check out uh, if you want to just experiment with VR for the first time. I see someone mention Amazon Sumerian. Yes, Sumerian is another infrastructure that does mm -hmm. kind of a little more versatile, a little more kind of um, welcoming to first time creators of um, VR. Okay, and then um, Elizabeth, let's see, I have a question more along the lines of the content creation storytelling end of things. Uh, I work with artists, so I'm trying to have students see the potentials in researching these platforms and their aesthetics experiential design. Do you anticipate a rising career paths that cover education and content creation? So I, I can honestly say we've been looking for people in that field and it has been very hard, definitely. Um, and Aditya, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think it's very hard to bring these people together. Traditionally, people that go into VR are people in gaming companies or um, maybe in architecture and things like that. And education usually gets cutting edge technology last. And so maybe in a while there will be a lot of, there should be a lot of jobs in this field. But as of right now, I don't think we're seeing much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will grow, it will grow. And as with any new technology, it's typically the consumer kind of entertainment and marketing and advertising. Mm -hmm. then kind of the, the industry use cases like manufacturing and then military and government that tend to gain um, early traction. And that's what's been happening with VR. I mean, everything that has been going well for VR has been in all those fields. And then of course, video gaming is another um, huge one. But the next natural ones that kind of slowly gain traction are healthcare, education. Um, and healthcare has been doing a lot with VR. Education is just getting started. Um, so this is definitely a wonderful time to get interested and involved with VR because it is going to be the next big thing. And this is only happening largely because hardware costs are rapidly going down. Right. Um, 
and and hardware is just becoming more and more accessible. Um, a lot of us believe that the Oculus Quest was the inflection point back in May 2019 was when they rolled out. Um, and it really was the first VR headset. And just to put it in perspective, I mean, when I started working with VR in 2014 or 2015, the equivalent hardware um, kind of um, specs of the Oculus Quest was at least $4,000 to $5,000 back then. And, there, and it was super bulky, super heavy, lots of wires and now you have this device that you can put in your backpack that requires no wires no additional pcs none of that and, and it's just fascinating for it's for i think just under 400 dollars. Mm -hmm. and i think you asked what the job title was for that role we um struggled so we took we just had content creator initially um but one uh name that we've seen is immersive designer Although that tends to fall on the design side and not necessarily researching on the content side. Yeah. And, and by any chance, is there, can you do a demo of a lesson or do you have a demo or a, a video of, of a lesson that you've done? We, we have YouTube videos that kind of 2D videos that show you kind of walking through a VR experience. It's not, of course, mm -hmm. not the same thing. Right. But um, we can probably share that after the, like maybe we can send an email out to everyone with the, with the URL. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. 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 We could maybe play it while we're answering the other questions. Um, I don't know, Amrita. I, I'll have to dig it up. Um, oh, oh, why, yeah, yeah. It might just be easier to, to share yeah, it. We can yeah. just share it. And again, if there's anyone, if any of you do have access to a Quest or a, or a Rift or a Vive, um, please feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to find ways in which you can bring our content to schools, um, to the schools that you work with. So maybe you can describe just what are some of the things in biology that you find lend themselves to VR that, you know, that you've done? Yeah, so, um, so we've only touched on five biology experiences right now just because we were focusing on cells. And so we kind of did um, building eukaryotic cells, flying through the cell, and then we picked more procedural um, topics. So we did DNA replication, RNA transcription, and RNA translation. And those are the modules that we focused on right now for biology, um, but mm -hmm. we still plan to go on to more um, earth science type things. In some schools, it still falls under biology. So like the water cycle, rock cycle. Um, we're trying really hard not to make modules just for the sake of making them. Right, right. And how about for physics, for example? What Physics, were, it's, physics is actually um, a great use case of VR. So right now we focus completely on mechanics. So you have your friction, your relative motion, circular motion, and you're basically just trying things out in this playground. And you get to actually see the trails and the vectors and the free body diagrams. Um, so I think someone um, was just asking if we have physics modules. We do, we have demo videos as well. So um, other than I can definitely share APKs with you guys. For now, we've done um, like the inclined plane, friction, different things like that. Yeah, and and so the beauty of physics is kind of uh, so so while one could still pick up a ball and throw it in the real world as well, the ability to see the trail of the ball and like kind of manipulate the angle of incidence and kind of predict where the ball lands, and then the added feature of then manipulating gravity potentially and having your students try to experience what it would be like to throw that same ball on the moon or throw that same ball when gravity is totally not present and really try to understand how the laws of motion are universal and how they are physically kind of getting that physical intuition for what motion and the laws of motion are is kind of our goal with the physics um, modules. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering if, I don't, if Hari Jant, I hope I'm pronouncing your name close or accurately, could unmute because it's, you have an interesting question. I'm not, I'm not sure I completely get it. Are you, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Can you turn that off? Hang on one second. Uh, so I, I produce VR content um, and I also teach ethnographic film course where my students produce VR content. And the two questions that I have is one is about um, how to kind of trans take the content that is produced and uploaded on, on, on YouTube and Vimeo and have it appear in spaces like the environment like Oculus Go. We haven't had very much success with that. And also yeah. the second question I have is, uh, how do you deal with translations and closed captioning when you're producing or creating VR content? 
Mm -hmm. a great question um so yeah. for the first one um when we were initially just making simple videos we did put it on youtube as long as your students are fine with their content being open sourced because once you put it on youtube it is open source uh i believe there's a simple script metadata script that you can inject into the video and then youtube will just take it and handle it versus trying to get it on the oculus store um, Aditya, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so the point to note is YouTube supports 360 video, um, which is non-interactive. Um, it's just 360 video. Um, so if you want your users to real time click on stuff and make like kind of actively interact with an environment or a scene, then YouTube will not support that. Um, at the same time, there are other kind of third party panoramic tool platforms that let you kind of upload individual 360 images. There's a ton of these platforms out there um, where um, you can essentially string together a bunch of 360 still images and create some sort of a tour um, and have an embed uh, kind of info points and markers and have users click on them and it kind of pops up a, a text bubble um, within the 360 environment. And the beauty of this is most of these will work in your web browser so you don't have to install any software and you often just get a URL that they generate and you can then just load that URL on your smartphone and then kind of put your phone in a Google Cardboard and then experience an entire um, VR experience. Um, for YouTube, bring, so I think YouTube makes the most sense. Yeah, so with the Go, you want to upload it to YouTube and then see it. But again, it's 360 video. So if you want interactive and live action, so not just interactive and still, but interactive and uh, kind of movement and animation and live action, then you would have to move um, beyond kind of... Um, YouTube and these third-party platforms that kind of jump into a platform like possibly Unity. There are some new ones that are coming up that let you also embed interactivity onto a 360 video. Um, but um, um, I think largely um, YouTube works best when it's non-interactive. I mean, YouTube only works when it's not interactive. And, and what about accessibility? What's your experience with making it making the content accessible. Yep, yep. So so one thing I'd say uh, in the word virtual reality, it says nothing about virtual reality being having anything to do with the eyes or with eyesight or with seeing. Um, the, the, the whole point of virtual reality is the ability for us to make you believe that you are present somewhere else. Um, and um, and it's that sense of, of feeling like you are you are elsewhere. And and so it's really interesting why most VR hardware focuses on manipulating your sense of seeing. And that's only because our visual perception tends to dominate all our other sense organs. Um, but there are lots of virtual reality experiences like Bose has a big one that they released recently, which is purely based on audio and just sound. Um, even in our lab at Stanford, one of the first demos that we show um, visitors is this helicopter motion experience where there's no video, we just have you close your eyes and we just have a bunch of stereoscopic speakers and kind of 3D um, uh, speakers out there that simulate um, 360 audio. And we're able to demonstrate how audio can also play a very powerful role in simulating a sense of um, virtual reality. The other point that I wanna say on accessibility is VR is a very powerful tool to teach or to educate someone on accessibility and to bring about a deeper sense of sensitivity and empathy towards um, the topic. Um, uh, there have been some very successful and popular 360 films that have been made on, on blindness um, where um, you actually go through an entire experience um, uh, with uh, as, as though you're someone who has very low um, um, kind of a very a lower sense of vision um, and it's a beautiful movie um, um, I don't remember the name off the top of my head but it was at Tribeca as well um, a couple of years ago um, so there's a ton of VR experiences that have uh, been on kind of simulating what it's like to be on a wheelchair for a day and kind of that that first person perspective of a day in the life of someone on a wheelchair and kind of just you empathizing with the difficulty of doing simple day-to-day -day tasks um, when you don't have an accessible ramp near you um, in the in the school that you're at, for example. Um, so, so I'll kind of flip that and say that VR is a very powerful educational tool for accessibility and disability research. Um, for, um, in terms of accessibility of VR as a technology itself, the, the headsets fundamentally depend or rely explicitly on vision um, but there is a lot of um, kind of new and upcoming VR um, platforms and devices that focus on kind of tapping into your other sense organs. And something we did notice and this is not research backed um, so but something we did notice is some students that did have ADHD or just um, struggled to focus in class really enjoyed VR because it blocked out all other distractions. Mm -hmm. So it was a good way for those children to learn mm -hmm. but this is not research backed. Can you have subtitles? 
someone. Um, someone asked about that. So I think right now there is a lot of research going into um, how to place text on a screen um, in VR. I think Google is actually doing a lot of work in the space. Um, so yes, I think you can have subtitles. We've chosen not to right now just because uh, you don't actually, we've, we've tried to avoid using voiceovers as far as possible in our content. Um, so we just have pointers. Um, but if it is a video, I think if you can use the best UI UX practices, um, subtitles could work. And we can, I, I don't remember which video that no, there was. are. So I, I think, I think the examples for you to look at are like, there's a lot of 360 films that have been made, short films, uh, feature films that mm -hmm. have been made in other languages um, and that uh, kind of have subtitles in them. It's, well, it's just, you have to do a little bit of experimentation yeah. with the right angle yeah. and the height. Um, but it, it, it works. I think some people had some more questions. There's a question on mass and gravity. Yes. So how would you experience gravity in VR or how would you experience mass or mass and gravity? So the way that we are choosing to handle it, I think it depends on um, who's creating the experience. Um, but for us, you can actually manipulate um, different physical properties using Unity. And that's a really great thing about the engine once you understand the nuances. Um, so when you actually take a physical object in that playground or environment, so if I throw the ball up and I throw it down, and first I show you how it feels on Earth, right? So the ball goes up, it goes down. Okay, great. This feels like real life. I've established this. Next, if we put you on the moon, and this time it goes up and then it takes a lot longer to come back down. Your body is intuitively going to tell you that the gravity has changed. Um, when it comes to things like math, um, you can actually make it such that the object doesn't move as easily because it's heavier versus something else. And you can add simple vibrations to your controllers. And these are things that you can only do on six dot. You can't do any of this on the three dot devices. Um, but you can add like small vibrations and things like that. And it, you'd find that it's actually really simple to trick the brain into thinking different things. Hmm. Yeah, and, and that's the beauty of vision, right? I think your sense of vision is so dominating and so strong that you can do quite a lot with just sight, even though without, without and, and with very basic haptic feedback through vibration motors on the controllers. Yes, and I think someone also mentioned that subtitles can make people feel sick. It definitely does. Um, so one of the good things about um, having six stop devices is less people tend to fall sick because you actually have control of the entire experience versus a three off environment where you're watching this video and you might get dizzy. But if I'm the one physically making the movements and doing things, um, most people don't get motion sickness. Using yeah. the, the, and kind of, if I were to put some more terminology to why you get motion sick is because um, when you have static subtitles in a dynamic VR experience, that breaks presence. And presence is again, that feeling of being there. And when it breaks presence, it causes this dissonance in your head where part of you wants to believe you're somewhere else. The other part is consciously telling you, no, look, there's subtitles floating in front of me and that doesn't happen in the real world. Um, and um, as a result of that, you, you, that can lead to motion sickness. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess we're, we're heading towards the top of the hour. So if you were, if you wanted to leave everybody with, let's say, two or three things that you most wanted them to take out of this session. Uh, why don't you each talk about maybe two or three things that, you know, you think in terms of using VR in the classroom, people should know, mm -hmm. most know. Mm -hmm. uh, I can go ahead with one and then I guess, yeah. an but um, I would say the most important thing is whenever you are choosing, choosing content to give your kids, make sure or people that are your learners um just make sure that it's content that's actually useful and not something that's a gimmick um so just ensure that it is something that is filling in a gap that you currently see you're not trying to replace something that works great by showing your kids a movie with vr instead um and just make sure that it's limited as far as possible vr shouldn't be a replacement to anything that currently exists in the classroom yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the thing with VR is it, 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 it can very easily pass off as this new glamorous new technology that's shiny. And of course, it works. Of course, it's a powerful tool and a technology. And very often, if the motivations to bring it into your environment or your school or your context are not aligned are not meaningful, um, 
very often what will end up happening over time is your device is just going to collect dust on the shelf. Um, if you truly want this to be meaningfully integrated, then it has to really be coming in with a purpose. And very often the content and the design of that content um, has to be meaningfully thought and well thought out and has to be really aligned with the objectives of your environment. The last, the other takeaway I want to share is there's lots of VR, there's lots of different kinds of VR and there's, um, and each kind works for a different purpose, for a specific purpose. In some cases, very simple Google Cardboard VR is the answer. In others, it's not. In many cases, VR is often almost never the answer. Um, and in some cases, VR is the only answer. So, so definitely, um, again, uh, it, it's important to think very carefully through it. And, um, and I think that's kind of what we want to do differently as, um, as in spirit is, yes, we are a VR company. And yes, our goal is to push for the integration of VR um, into schools and, and environments, but we think it would, it really makes sense if it truly makes a difference and if it truly has a meaningful um, purpose in the classroom. Yeah, I love what you'd said before that what one of the things that VR does is it, is, is it enhances a sense of presence, which is very motivational and engaging. And it really works in the classroom when it's both aligned with curriculum and it's something that the teacher is also interested in. And if you really want it to work in the classroom, you need both of those. Now, it also is expensive. So do you know of any funding streams that teachers could tap into to be able to pay for VR? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of STEM grants that exist. Um, a lot of times VR does fall um, under STEM. I do think um, there are some state funds that you could look into or national grants as well. Uh, the, and, and like we said, our recommendation is to actually just keep a VR lab for your whole school. That way you're not spending as much money. Um, and you would just have three or four devices for the entire school and then you'd just be looking on the software side or the content side. Person. Yeah, and yeah, and 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 also we we try to help um, uh, you out uh, with locating the right grants. So if you ever are struggling in your kind of state or your district or your community to to find the right grant, then please feel free to reach out to us, and we can help point you in the right direction. Um, um, typically, um, yes, STEM grants, science grants, technology budgets. Um, that's typically where VR falls. Um, in, but again, these are very tight and very um, narrow um, uh, budgets, uh, and we understand that um, as well. Um, but 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 the hope is that as this technology grows and as it gains more traction, um, there will be more and more avenues for um, um, funding this um, at scale. Yeah, I'm looking at the comments, and there's a lot of people thanking you because <laughs> um, oh. because you 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 both obviously are very passionate about about kids and about education and incredibly knowledgeable about how to use uh, VR in order to reach kids and, and help teachers. So, um, so I also wanted to thank you for appearing uh, and, um, and helping us, helping us learn how to incorporate VR into our education system in our classrooms. No, thank, thank you for having me. us. Yeah. Thank you for, yeah, at this time, taking the time out to actually listen to us. Oh yeah, no, yeah. you guys are fascinating. So it's, it's the honor. I'm, I'm sure I speak for, for everybody here. The honor was ours. So thank you again. And I hope to see you online and I hope that serious play uh, can, um, can have a physical conference, but if not, um, we'll keep these going with the, with kind of a virtual conference and letting the speakers uh, speak online. So thank you again mm -hmm. and uh, awesome. hope to see you online and or in person. And I guess this is Mitch, Mitch Weisberg, and I'll sign off for EdChat Interactive. Uh, see you all soon. Next week, we have a session on augmented reality and digital storytelling. So check out our website at edchatinteractive.org. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you.